stand and sing this morning. I was buried with me, my shame. And who could carry that kind of weight? It was mine too. Till I met you.
You may be seated. 
Good morning, welcome to Faith Promise Sunday. It is my favorite Sunday of the whole year. I'm not ashamed to say that. I love the Sunday that we get to talk about missions. I also think this morning is very important to our congregation because just like you get an annual checkup or you should get an annual checkup from your doctor each year, I believe this Sunday is kind of a part of our annual checkup. I believe this is a barometer of the health of our church when we talk about and then go and do missions. Because you see, God is a missionary God. From the time that mankind sinned in the Garden of Eden, God started his redemptive plan to bring people back to him. God wants relationship with us, with me, with you, with the whole world. And he started a plan where people, he wanted his name, his message, he wanted it out to the world. Some he sent, some he brought. But God has a plan. You can see that all throughout Scripture. God is a missionary God. And so I believe when we're talking about God and his heart, it's missions. And so that's why this Sunday is very, very important. Let me show you a couple of verses that kind of back this up. In Revelation 7, it says this. Revelation 7 says this. When God's talking about, as I looked and this is in heaven, and behold a great multitude that no one could number from every, every nation, from all, all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne of the Lamb. Isn't that going to be a great picture and a great scene? Sometime, I hope soon, when we're in heaven worshiping God and there's someone there from every nation, every tongue, every tribe will be there worshiping God. That's the kind of relationship that God wants with us. Look over in 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy says, who does God want to say? This is good and it's pleasing in the sight of our Savior who desires all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of truth. God wants us all saved. He wants us all to know and have a relationship with him. And possibly the most famous missionary verse in the Bible that you've never thought about before as a missionary verse is John 3, 16. Will you read this one with me? Here we go. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. That's a mission verse. That's how much God loves each and every one of us. And so I'm excited this morning as we are here talking about missions, what we're doing both locally and around the world. And I also want to show you one more time our theme verse, because God is such a missionary God. Our theme verse this year is coming from John, the 12th chapter. Now, this is the week of the triumphant entry. This is after Jesus has come in, and Jesus, the Bible tells us, is preaching and teaching, and people are coming to know him, and there's a buzz around Jerusalem about Jesus, and it's one time when Jesus doesn't stop them. When they're saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Jesus allows that praise of him to happen. And Jesus is preaching and teaching. He's overturning the temple courts. He's cleansing the temple court. All in that week, people wanted to be with Jesus. They wanted to be around him. The Pharisees even said, see, the whole world has gone after him. And so this is a crazy time. And here's where our verse comes in. And this is what happens. Now, among them that went up to worship, talking about the Passover, at the feast were some Greeks. So they came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and asked him, sir, we wish to see Jesus. I think it's very interesting. We don't know a lot about this passage of Scripture. I think it's very interesting that the Greeks went to the one disciple whose name was Greek. They figured, hey, that guy can probably tell us about Jesus. And so we're using that verse not only today for our theme, for our mission trips this this year in 2020. I think it's pretty cool. Sir, we want to see Jesus. Ma'am, We want to see Jesus. And I just think, I hope and pray that as this year goes along, you'll understand this theme because not only are we called as a congregation to send people, we see that in Scripture all the time when Jesus would send out the two, the twelve, Peter and James and all those, he would send people to the world, but then he also would bring the unchurched to the people of Jesus. Sometimes we send, sometimes we go, but we need to be ready. Paul told Timothy, always be ready to give an account for what you believe. And so we hope and pray as a congregation we can help people over there see Jesus. We pray that we can help unreached people groups see Jesus. But then to bring it back in, we pray you as an individual will help people see Jesus. I'd almost ask the guys up in the booth to just flash this back and forth so it would get ingrained in your mind because we got a catchy little thing going on here, 2020, 2020, 2020, 2020, that kind of thing. 
I hope this year, when anytime you write the word or the number 2020, the year, I've started leaving a little space in between 20 and 20 just to remind myself that I need to be showing people Jesus clearly. 2020 vision is clearly. We want to see Jesus clearly. So I hope maybe 2020, 2020 will get locked in with you. Leave a little space in between your 20 and 20. Don't put the dash because that's going to mess up the people at the bank when they see about three dashes down there. But just one, 19, 20, a little space, 20. And be reminded we're supposed to see Jesus. I just think that's a cool verse, and I think God's given us this little catchy thing that we can remember all year. 2020, 2020 vision. Let's help people see Jesus. You're going to hear about that today. We're going to worship Jesus Christ, and then you're going to get to hear what we're doing collectively all around the world. So glad you're here. It's Mission Sunday, and it's awesome. So let's keep worshiping Jesus Christ. Would you stand as we... uh you worship him this morning. First, let's, let's pray. Father, we come to you this morning lifting up praises for your goodness, for your glory, and we uh, ultimately do this so that others eventually will, will be able to join in with us through this giving, through our missions program. And Father, we lift these songs this morning to give you glory. Father, yours is the victory forever. Amen. Our fight is with weapons unseen. Your enemies crash to their knees as we rise up in worship. When trials unleash like a flood, the battle belongs to our God as we cry out in
Psalm 119 says, your extravagant kindness to me makes me want to follow your words even more. Teach me how to make good decisions. Give me revelation light, for I believe in your commands. Before I was humbled, I used to always wander astray, but now I see the wisdom of your words. Everything you do is beautiful, flowing from your goodness. Teach me the power of your wonderful words. Proud, boastful people make up lies about me because I am passionate to follow all that you say. Their hearts are dull and void of feeling, but I find my true treasure in your truth. The punishment you brought me through was the best thing that could have ever happened for me, for it taught me your ways. The words you speak to me are worth more than all the riches and wealth in the whole world. We're in this time of year that we focus on missions. Faith promise where we devote extra above and beyond to support these people that are going out to the world and trying to teach people about these riches. That for those of you in this room that know about it and believe in it, should be something that you value more than anything in the world like the psalmist wrote there. As we go in the service today and we go into communion and offering and then the message and we give our promises at the end of the, end of the service, this is what we're ultimately doing here. We're trying to get this book, these truths, these treasures around the world to people that either don't have it in their language, don't know about it, or in cultures that have just squelched this for years. Let's pray as we come around the table. Father, for those of us that are coming today and we're eating and we're drinking, we know these words in this Bible to be true. We value these treasures, these riches, and we'll th we're so thankful for it. So thankful that we take time every week to sit around and just remember the moment that your son came and died and eventually rose again to give us this amazing gift, these truths, this way to live, and these goals. So Father, as we eat and drink today, we do it in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Before we pass the offering back today, we're doing a couple offering uh, collections during the service. One right now is going to be the just regular offering that we take every single week, uh, general fund, building fund. Um, but at the end of the service, we're going to collect that special offering uh, that we've been talking about the past couple weeks, and they'll talk about a little bit more here in a second. And we'll also collect the faith promise cards um, and your pledges at that point. Would you pray with me for an offering? Dearly Father, thank you for the chance to come today and to worship you here in this building that is uh, safe. That's one that we can come and freely share our joy uh, towards you through worship, where we can dive into your word with friends and family around us. Um, Father, I ask that you take this money this morning that we give. Father, use it for your glory. Reach those that need it. Close those, feed those that need that. Ultimately, grow your kingdom through these pennies, dollars, checks, direct deposits, whatever else it is, Father. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. It's great to see all of you this morning. I appreciate you being here, and I think you're really going to be blessed. This is one of the best Sundays of the entire year. Danny said this earlier, Faith Promise Sunday is an important Sunday for us. It's just a good Sunday, and it's one that I've really been looking forward to, and not only because I get to share the platform here with somebody who's a, a friend and also a, has been a real mentor to me, but also because we're just excited to be able to share with you today what's happening around the world through the, the missions giving at this church. And I think it really is exciting. There's so many things that we don't get to see that are happening that are huge. Now, let me just make this general statement before we get started. You know, for a lot of years, I have been a real mission supporter. In fact, I guess I don't know that you could be a follower of Jesus and not support missions. You know, not be a fan of missions because Jesus is the guy who gave us our mission. He gave us our marching orders and missions are sort of infused into what it means to follow him. The story of Christ is the story of how God came to this earth on a mission. But for me, I mean, for years, I talked about missions, supported missions financially, encouraged people to go on trips, and I've been a big cheerleader and all of that, but things changed for me personally in 2016. Because that's when I was able to make the first of two mission trips that I've made since then and go over and see with my own eyes what we're talking about. 
And frankly, that is a game changer. I tell you what, I went to Togo in 2016 and Zimbabwe in 2017. And no kidding, what I saw over there has just changed how I look at this completely because when you see the people and you interact with what's happening and you get this glimpse of how giant this church is, I mean, the church of Jesus Christ that stretches around the world, it changes the way that we talk in this moment. I mean, for me, it will never be the same. And that's why I am excited this morning. Danny and I have a chance to share with you some of the things that are happening that maybe you haven't heard that I think will really warm your heart and all also will help you to catch this bigger glimpse of what the word missions is all about. All right, so this is Faith Promise Sunday. And Danny, I think maybe the way to start would be like this. What is Faith Promise? Because there may be people who are here who didn't grow up in a church that had that as, a, as one of their traditions. What do we mean when we talk about Faith Promise and why is this so important? Okay, before I answer that question, I want to make sure uh, the guys are, should be passing out your cards now. So I want to make sure that everyone get a Faith Promise card. I can't see you guys, but uh, here they come. They're coming, they're on their way. So uh, they're going to be passing. If they kind of miss you, just wave your hand or throw something at them or something like that. But just, we want to make sure everyone has one of these cards. Don't uh, look too much right now. We're going to go over that here in just a little while. But uh, just uh, kind of hang on to that. We want to make sure you have one of them. Now to your question. Number one, what is Faith Promise? Faith Promise is the way that we fund missions here at Pinedale. It's the idea of giving above and beyond anything else that you give. By faith, you're saying, hey God, I understand world missions and I wanna play a part in world missions. And so by faith, God, as you give me this money, as you provide, I am going to give. It's faith promise. By faith, I ask you give God. And as you give, then I promise to give this amount of money. This is something that we do not track. You don't sign your name to this. This is really between you and God. So this is one of the, to me, one of the most pure forms of giving because it's up to you and God. Hey God, here's what I get and I understand about missions and here's what I want to give. So that is what faith promise is. Did everyone get a card? Everyone get a card. There's some up in the top, if we can get back up that way, up in the balcony. All right, very good. Now, why is Faith Promise important? A couple of reasons. Number one, Faith Promise is important here to Pinedale because as you give through the rest of 2020, it's how we then turn around and give to our missionaries. Every February, we have a missions meeting, and we set a budget of how much we're going to give each ministry every month. And so when you give throughout the course of 2020, when you give, we then get to fulfill our commitment to our missionaries. And why is it important to you as an individual? I honestly believe that there are several ways you can get involved in missions. One, you can just kind of dip your toe in the water and you can go on a mission trip, a short-term mission trip, or you can, you, can, um, you can be a part of a Leave It Better, or you can come be a part of our missions committee. We meet the second Sunday of every month. We'd love to have you. Come, if your missions excite you, come join us. We'd love to have you. That's a way of kind of dipping your toe in the missions water, so to speak. But if you want to jump in, you want to get in the deep end, this is where we're starting right here. Because you're understanding, God, I understand world missions. And I want to be a part of it through my giving. And so I, faith, by, I promise this amount by faith, and I'm going to give it to missions. And so it's very important. I really do believe it, is, it shows the health of a congregation and... It kind of shows where you're at in your walk. And of course, when we talk about missions, that means so many different things. You've got a list, I think, in your bulletin of all of the different organizations that come through Faith Pro that come from Faith Promise that are supported by our missions committee. Some of those are around the world and some of them are at home, right? Um, how, how are we connected? Can you just talk about the different countries represented, the different ministries, how we're connected with those? Absolutely. In your bulletin, I think we put 32 in there. And most of the ones that are in the bulletin are the ones we support, we support monthly. And so those are the ones that we have advocates for, and we're really involved with those folks. However, throughout the course of a year, we have a lot of folks come and ask for other help and assistance, and we partner with them. And so there's probably around 50 or so missions and ministries that we support that we're a part of any given year, and we do that on purpose. We decided a long time ago we don't want to be a church that we sponsor 400 missionaries and only send them about two bucks a month. We decided we want to sponsor and work with about 50 that we can have a relationship with. And we want to give meaningful money to those places. Some of the ones on, that you're looking at, we're almost their entire support 
And so that's how involved we are with them. And we take teams over there and we get involved with them. And it's just, it's good. There's about 15 countries represented in the bulletin there. And then IDES, International Disaster Emergency Services, they go all over the world. So literally, our missions covers the whole world. So it's pretty cool what we're involved in. It's just a real, there really is an amazing legacy to this. And I, I didn't understand that maybe quite as well until we got to Zimbabwe. There was this thing, and I've told you this before, I'm a preacher, I only have so many stories, so deal with it. I just have to recycle them. But well, when we were leaving Zimbabwe, there was, there was this moment as the bus was pulling out of, of the Mushamunda village where Danny asked the driver to take us to a hospital that was in the area. And that didn't really mean much to me. And in fact, here's a picture of the hospital. And it, it really doesn't look maybe that impressive. It definitely didn't to me. I mean, I was just looking at the, at the building going, well, I mean, it's nice for, for this area. It's a, it's a fine facility, but it didn't really mean much to me. But I turned around and looked around the bus and there were three different people on the bus who were literally wiping tears from their eyes while they looked at this building. And it, I was so confused. I mean, what, what is the deal with this? Well, it turns out that 50 years ago, Dr. Pruitt came to this area and to this church and had a vision for a hospital in this area. And he said, this is a need. I know you can't see it. You guys have never been over there. You don't understand the need, but trust me, we need this hospital. And people back then gave to build this. And so we were sitting on this bus and there were people on the bus whose parents and grandparents had given money to build this building. And they gave it without ever seeing it. I mean, they, they didn't even really understand the need except Dr. Pruitt said, we need it. And they gave money and now they were wiping tears away while they were looking at this building. It just, it really impacted me because it helped me to understand that what we're doing here is that. We are giving we're giving from faith and we're giving to something truly that we can't see, a part of the world that many of us will never really understand well. But what we're saying is, God, you're gonna do something big. That right there has impacted so many people in that area and it's just a legacy over the years. Hundreds you know? and thousands of people have been impacted by that and most of the people that gave to that never saw it. And that's why, once again, we've, you've said it, I've said it, Faith Promise is one of the most pure forms of giving there is because you just trust. Our missions committee, we work hard at finding the right partners, and so we get into that. And so come be a part of that. If you love missions, come be a part of our missions committee. I've said that twice. Wait, which leads to this morning. So we're, we're obviously re-upping our Faith Promise money, but there is a twist this year, right? I mean, we're doing something a little bit different. It's a special offering. We've been talking about it for, for a few weeks now that requires eyes of faith. Right. Absolutely, and this is where this gets me excited, and I hope it does you too, because we have found four different places in the world. Three of them are definitely working with unreached people, and the third one, or the fourth one, is kind of doing the same thing. Y'all have heard us talk about them. Let me remind you real quickly and show you some pictures. You give the mission guy a mic, and he's got to show some <laughs> pictures. So here we go. Two weeks ago, we introduced you to Austin and Amanda, and they're working out of Ghana but they're going to, in this year, in 2020, they're going to plant a church in Burkina Faso. Burkina Faso is the highest percentage of Muslims in Africa. 97, 98% of, of their population are Muslim. And they're also targeting an unreached people group in that area, and they're gonna plant a Christian church. And I think that's so cool. Now here is, if you've ever been to Africa, a typical Sunday morning, other than, the Ben Roethlisberger shirt. I just thought that was, that's crazy. Hey, if, if you're a Steeler fan, see, you did get to see your team play today. So. <laughs> so, you saw them on TV today. You saw and, them on TV today. And that's as close as you're getting. So, the, so, so there it is. There goes their money, too. Well, Thanks, well, Thanks a lot. We love you, Steeler fans. But that's what a church looks like underneath a shade tree over in Africa. We're going to help them finish a building that's going to be a community center. They're going to not only have worship there, but they're going to have classes there, and they're going to teach from there. It's just going to be a place where people come and see and meet Jesus Christ. Why do we support places all around the world? Because of this right here. They are baptizing folks left and right, and the kingdom of God is expanding, and it just doesn't get any better than that. We get to be a part of that. You saw the picture of the building. They've, they've gotten it to a place. We're going to help finish that with our offering today. That's just so cool. That's number one. Well, hold on. Now, can, I, can I say something about that? Sure. Burkina Faso, uh, there was an article in Christianity Today this week. I don't know how many of you saw it. 
that listed the, the most dangerous places now, the highest levels of persecution around the globe for Christians. And if you haven't seen that, you should go check it out. The fastest riser on the list this year was Burkina Faso, that they went basically from almost not on the list last year to like top 10 this year as the most dangerous places for Christians. And one of the things we're doing here, or that we're not doing, but we're, we're helping happen, is that we're not only planning a church, but there is a preacher that's going into that country to serve in that country. And I was telling Danny before we started today, I said, you know, when God called me to ministry, it was terrifying for me. But here we are in Winston-Salem. This guy is being called to ministry in Burkina Faso. I mean, he is going right into the teeth of one of the most dangerous places in the entire world, and he's going boldly to share the gospel. How cool is it that he's got that kind of boldness and, and we get to partner with him? It's just amazing. We forget, I read that same article, we forget how many Christians, thousands of Christians that are persecuted annually because of their faith. We forget that when we sit here in the good old U.S. of A. Not to say anything's wrong with that. Nothing wrong with being blessed as long as we do something with our blessings. And the cool thing, the other cool, cool, cool number four on this story is the fact that he is uh, from there. Right. An indigenous, we're working with indigenous preachers in these places because we couldn't show up and be a preacher there. Right. We wouldn't get in the country, but the indigenous people can. And so it's just so neat how God has worked all this. Mm. And they're just ready to launch and we're gonna get to help push that button with our offering today. That's so cool. Hey, so, can, I, can I make a comment? Of course. You know, we've got a bet on how many times Danny will cry this service. And <laughs> so far I'm doing all well, right. This is, just, this is what really gets me because first hour he was just boohoo in the whole service and I, I mocked him a little bit and also collected a paycheck for that. And I'm watching him up here and he's just got these tears in his eyes and he keeps like pushing in really hard to keep them in his eyes and it's really getting on my nerves. I just want you to know that. <laughs> that Thank you. That's I found all. the over-under, and so I'm going to keep it <laughs> That's under all. this Thank time. You. So, anyway, uh, Solomon and Allison in Tanzania, Africa. Now, here's what's so cool about this story is this is not technically an unreached people group. First of all, there's only 10,000 of them in the world that speak this one language. But enough of them are Christian that they're not considered unreached. They're the Kaisai, K-I-S-I, the Kaisai people group in Tanzania. However, the Kaisai people have no Bible. No Bible. And so the last couple of years, Solomon and Allison, who's brilliant, Solomon speaks eight languages. And so he just drops that like, oh, which one you want me to talk today? And I'm like, <laughs> I can't even get English. But eight languages, Allison's a, Allison's a typesetter and all, a linguist. And li I don't even know what she is, but she's something. And they've been over there working with this Kaisai people to, number one, teach them an alphabet. They didn't have an alphabet. So they go over and say, e is this letter or is that letter? And they just start trying to figure out an alphabet. And now that they've gone through that, they have an alphabet formed. Now they're ready to print Bibles in their own language. They're going to start with a couple books at a time. Let me let you tell the story. But hang on before we do that. Sorry, 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 sorry. How remote are these people? You're going to hear her say, but I want you to hear it first, and then you'll hear it a second time. It's a four-hour uh, ride in a car from their office to the lake. And then there's a six-hour boat ride if you get in a good boat. You don't get in a good boat, you'll hear how long it takes. And just, this is amazing how remote these people are. And we get to be a part of it. Here we go. People groups our team is serving is the Kisi people. There are about 10,200 speakers of Kisi. Their main economic activity is fishing, making pots, and agriculture where they grow cassava. They are one of the most remote communities in East Africa, still without a Bible in their own language. The Kisi are geographically isolated from other peoples. They live along the shores of Lake Nyasa, one of the largest and deepest lakes in the East African Rift Valley Lakes, and it's the third largest lake in Africa. It is surrounded by walls of mountains, with few or rough roads, the Livingstone Mountains and the Nika Plateau. There is a lack of phone network in the area, so communication is a challenge. Lake Nyasa's northern shore is a four hour drive from our Mbeya office. From the northern shore, our team has rented a small wooden skiff from the local Catholic church to make the journey to the Kisi people. 
It takes about six hours of bouncing across the bumpy waters to reach the first Kisi village. Other trips, our team has squeezed themselves into one of the wooden hulks that ferry local cargo and residents. Those first aboard get seats on cross beams. Others ride sacks of maize and fish. This trip takes 12 hours. Since there is no guest housing in the village, our teams are hosted by villagers in their homes. Our team has made these long journeys several times over the past few years, studying the language and developing an alphabet. The Kisi now have an approved alphabet and Bible translation is in its early stages. They are one step closer to receiving the life-giving message of the gospel in a language they understand. That is amazing. Isn't that amazing? I told Matthew, I don't know if I want one of the cross members. I'll take a sack of maize. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd take a sack of maize over a sack of fish. I don't want to sit on a sack of fish for 12 hours. For funsies, raise your hand if you have five Bibles at home. Raise your hand. Just don't be, if you have five Bibles at home, probably. Isn't that amazing? They don't have one. There's one, Matthew. Good grief. <laughs> We get to help them read the scripture. How much do we take that for granted? We got Bibles laying all over the place, one in our car and one in the house and one in the office, so you don't have to worry about carrying it back and forth. They don't have a Bible. And to teach them the alphabet, and we get to be a part of that. Mm -hmm. Our offering today is going to go to help put the Bible in certain books to get them over there so they can start having the Bible in their own language. That's just so... So cool. That's the four things that our offering is going to go to. If that didn't move you, I don't know. Go, hush. hush. <laughs> no, actually, all right, no kidding. I'm just thinking, I've, your passion here it really touches me. And I, I, want to push, I want to push one step further. You said these four groups, you've, you've used this term several times, are four unreached people groups. Just in case that's a new term to somebody, can you tell us quickly, what do you mean by the term Maybe unreached? Maybe here we go. Unreached for forever. It's a mission term, so let me get geeky here a little bit on mission stuff. But it is a missions term that for the most part meant somewhere around less than 4% of any one population had really a Christian or Bible believer or a movement. They were enough to sustain the movement. So less than 4% of a certain people group would be considered unreached. And that means they don't have the gospel in their language. I like the new version that I think the Joshua Project is now putting up. Joshua Project, great website if you want to see some more about unreached people group. Their definition is unreached groups lack enough followers of Christ and resources to evangelize their own people. You know, to really make a movement, it has to come from within. Yes, someone from the outside can come tell them about Jesus, but then it's got to roll on its own. And so that's basically what unreached. And not only are our four things we're doing today, our offering going to unreached, our missions committee has been very adamant about sending money to unreached people. Over the last 30 years, about 40% of the money you give that goes overseas goes to unreached people work because we want to make a difference. We want to look and we want to see that. Does it matter to God, unreached people? Absolutely. I've already said God is a God that wants relationship with all of us. Let me show you one more time, Revelation 7, 9. This verse is just key when you start talking about why the buzz about unreached people. Because there's a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all the tribes, from all the peoples, from all the languages standing before the throne. They're going to be in heaven. They've got to hear about Jesus Christ. Let me quickly give you some really cool one, stats. One of those languages is the Kisi people yes, that one of those languages of Kisi. Now, isn't that going to be cool if, now once again, this isn't pat ourselves on the back time. It's go a couple feet lower and let's keep going. But it's, well, isn't it be cool if we're in heaven and a Kisi walks up and says, thanks for the Bible. Those were really good stories. Wouldn't that be cool? That'd be a cool thing. Anyway, <laughs> here's two quick things. And I just think this is neat. When Pinedale Christian Church was founded in 1913, 20% of the world's 23,000 people groups had been reached. So 23,000, roughly 23,000 people groups in the world speaking different language, different culture, different whatever. When Pinedale was formed, 20% had been reached. Today, 2020, guess what that number is? Over 70% of the world's unreached people group have been reached 
Here. Y'all clap a long time. Clap a long time. Here we go. And here's the thing. If every church our size or larger in America went after one unreached people group, guess what, folks? We would finish the task of getting the world That's evangelized right. in our generation. That's exciting. We're close to having the whole world knowing about Jesus Christ. I've said it before. If any one generation... Just one generation did what God wanted us to do. If any one generation would do that, what would the world look like? God's got plenty of people in his world right now to evangelize the world if those people would just do what he's asked, to go, to share Jesus Christ with other people. And yeah, it's important over there, but it's also important the person sitting across the cubicle to you. It's your aunt, your uncle. You've got to be ready. That's why uh, this, this whole 2020 and seeing Jesus clearly, it's, it's over there, and it's individual. We'll hit that in a second. In fact, it's just... in fact, when you say over there, just let, let's pause there a second, because I want to come back to the individual thing. But over there, we're talking about places right now that, that we can't even imagine what it's like in that country. Now, that, that Christianity Today list, we've got, we've got missionaries all over the globe right now, and lots of them are working in those areas. Right? I Absolutely. Mean, in the top 10, we've had one well, number one, we all know in here, we had one of our missionaries that was sent home last year because the country where they were working found out what they were doing. They were spreading Jesus Christ and they asked to leave. They were asked to leave and so they had to come home. There's people that when the bombs went off last week, heard them. Some of our missionaries are that close. We need to pray for our missionaries. We need to pray for them. Good grief. I don't know who, who over is five or six. Well, can I, so. can I push you, can I push sure. on that just a second? Just, so, not? so these are folks who are going right into the teeth of, of everything. I mean, they, they are boldly charging in, into the darkness. And so the question here is, does that work? Because in the world's eyes, in our culture's eyes, this is crazy. I mean, that, this lady who's taken her baby, she and her husband, this doctor and, and mountain climber who are taking their baby over to the former Soviet Union, in our culture's eyes, that is, that's ludicrous. I mean, it, it is a completely crazy concept. And yet, there are people doing this all over the place. So the question is, does this work? Because you guys on the missions committee hear so many stories. If somebody in this room asks, well, what's the return on the investment here? Does this really make a difference? How do you answer that? I could answer by saying, number one, I give you a story about any one of our missionaries. Number one, they wouldn't be our missionaries if they weren't <laughs> going out and changing the world because we have invested in people that are making a difference. So everyone on your bulletin, I can tell you a story. Let's get together. I'll tell you a story from every one of them. You want a couple specific? Let's go to Togo. Two years ago, you know, in here we said, hey, let's take up an offering and finish the school building. We took up an offering and we finished the school building. They now go from kindergarten to the 12th grade. They have offer all grades. They started 11 years ago with 12 students. This year, they have almost 600 hmm. students in their school. And it's not that they're just teaching them education. They're teaching them a Christian education. These kids are learning Bible verses. These kids are learning scripture. They've started four churches out of all those kids coming to school. That's, is it working? Yeah. Absolutely. Zimbabwe has graduated eight or nine or 10 ministers from Bible college. And now they're out in different places preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. People are coming to, by the hundreds and thousands to the Lord. The kingdom is expanding. You know another one? Our boy Robinson, little Robinson that we all kind of <laughs> adopted three or four years ago. You know, Robinson came to Lincoln College, and now he has his doctorate, and I probably shouldn't call him little Robinson. He has his doctorate. I should respect <laughs> him more. But Ro Dr. Manna, who is in Myanmar, he's the president of Myanmar Christian Mission right now. He's the president of their Bible college over there. And over Christmas break, they took a, they took a bunch of students and went up into the jungles of Myanmar and preached the gospel to thousands of people. And here's a couple of, they baptized all over the place in the name of Jesus Christ uh, over Christmas. This next one is when he's getting ready to preach <laughs> before uh, one of his night services. <laughs> he's, and, the one, and he's the he's one. He's the one with his little fake, that little Robinson. Oh, really <laughs> See, you shouldn't, call him, you shouldn't call him little Robinson with his little thumb up. Well, <laughs> he, he would not like that. That's Dr. Manna <laughs> there in the middle saying good job, but that's Dr. Manna. So anyway, I mean, there's stories all over the place, and you want to know if it's worth it. Let me tell you this. You tell me, is it worth it? When you give to Faith Promise, this little kid right here not only gets a Christmas meal, but he and, or she, and their mom and dad get to hear about Jesus Christ. Is it worth it? You tell me. 
If you look hard, that's a leaf that they form into a bowl. And that's what they're eating out of. And manna took mon or <laughs> Robinson took money that we sent over and did this Christmas tour. Mm -hmm. And people came to know Jesus Christ. You tell me, is it worth it? When you give to missions, it's one of the most pure forms of giving because you give it to the missions committee. We find places all over the world. We send it there and off it goes. Yes. Does it matter? Mm. I think so. That's just so cool. Keep going. What, just give some final thoughts here. Final Can't thoughts on this. Show. We are, as a missions committee, try hard. I'm finding really good places to put our money where we partner. So I want you to have confidence knowing when you give, we really try to make it not just where your dollar goes and makes a dollar. We try to find places where your dollar can turn into $10 or $100. We just, we look hard and try to find places that are preaching and teaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. They're all connected to us. And so feel good about what our commissions committee is going after. But maybe the greatest story of this 2020, and it's something that I'm praying about. The greatest story out of our theme this year in 2020 may be your story. Because we're not only asking you to give so we can tell people and help them see clearly Jesus overseas. We hope and pray that you will take to heart and maybe on a personal level, you will see a little better and maybe a little more aware of when people are coming to ask you. Maybe you're going to be the next Philip. And the Greeks are going to come to you and say, sir, we want to see Jesus. Ma'am, we want to see Jesus. And then as Paul told Timothy, you need to be ready to give them an account for why you believe and what you believe. Let me tell you about Jesus. I hope in 2020 you get a chance to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Maybe someone will come to you. Maybe you need to go to someone. 2020, this 2020 vision, I just hope maybe the greatest story coming up is your story as you share Jesus Christ. Because not only are we called to give, we're called to go. You read the verse in Matthew, it says, as you are going, take the gospel with you. And I want to ask you and challenge you. Yes, we want you to support Faith Promise. We want you to support this offering. But I want you to commit yourself to maybe this year, let me tell someone about Jesus Christ. And we're trying to help. In the three, last three Sundays, last three Sundays in February, we're offering a class called Eyewitness. And this class is going to be there in our Sunday morning, our Sunday school hours. It's going to be there so it can help you start that conversation. It's not going to teach and train you how to be Billy Graham and go beat the streets. It's going to help you just enter into that conversation with your child, with your uncle, with your coworker, with your neighbor. We want to challenge you as a church. Yeah, let's do great things in missions. How about you? What's your story? I hope and pray that might be the greatest story of all that comes out of this year. 2020, 2020 vision. Let's go do it. Let's pray together. Will you bow with me, please? Lord, it is a privilege and an honor to be in this conversation right now, Lord. It is an honor to be able to be part of what you're doing around this globe. Lord, give us all in this room the kind of passion that Danny is just dripping with right here, Lord. Set our hearts on fire. And Lord... Um, I just want to thank you that you allow us to be part of the greatest story that's ever been told, Lord, the greatest mission that's ever been given. And so, Lord, as we move forward here and as we take, take this offering in a few minutes, Lord, I just pray that you would open our hands and open our hearts, use this in a way that brings you glory. And Jesus, thank you for the opportunity to be near you this morning. And Father, if there's someone in this room right now who doesn't know the hope that comes from you, Jesus, let this be a day of salvation. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity. We ask this in your name. Amen. All right, folks, this is showtime here. What I want you to do, please, is to take this card and hold it in your hand. So um, you should have gotten one of these earlier. If you will just have this in your hand, I want to talk to you about what, what is on it right now. And while you hold this, let, let me just start with this question. What is this thing that, that you're holding? You know, there is this great story in the book of Exodus, and it really is a cool story. When God comes to Moses and he gives Moses this incredible mission that was way over Moses' head. And, you know, it's go, go to Egypt, free my people. And Moses is so freaked out. The, the job is so big and he feels so small. And so God asks Moses a really pregnant question. God says, what is in your hand right now, Moses? What is that in your hand? And Moses looks at his hand, and he is holding a wooden staff. I mean, that's it. It is just, there's nothing special about it. It's not like some fancy, ornate anything. He didn't buy it at Mass General Store. It is literally just a big stick, 
a staff. And God says, what is that in your hand, Moses? And Moses says, well, it's, it's the staff. And God says, put it on the ground right now. And Moses throws it on the ground, and suddenly the staff turns into a snake, which, by the way, is a really bad part of that story. That would have freaked me out. I don't really need that. But God was making a point to Moses. This thing that you're holding is more than it looks like. And actually, as the chapters go by, we find that Moses used that staff to perform miracles all over Egypt, not because there was anything special about the staff, but because there's something special about the Lord who will use whatever is in our hand in a big way. Now, I want you to listen to this because this is important. When God moves through us, when God works through people like us, he always asks us the same question. What have you got in your hand right now? What are you holding right now? And what we find is that even when what we're holding seems insignificant, that God will use what we have in ways that far exceed any expectation we could ever have. God is so great that when we hand him what we've got, he does incredible things. This thing in your hand right now is more than just a card. I mean, frankly, it's a nickel's worth of cardboard. It is nothing. But in God's hand, this card will help feed hungry people all around the world. This card will help teach students in Togo about the one true God, even though they live in a voodoo culture that preaches many gods all the time. This card will train ministers in Zimbabwe who will go out and share the good news of Jesus Christ. This card brings fresh drinking water to people in places in the world where there is no good drinking water. It ministers to refugees in Jordan. It brings light into communist China. You get what I'm saying here? Cardboard. This is nothing. But in God's hands, this is so much bigger than any of us understand. And so God is asking the question right now, what is this in your hand? This is big. And so I want you to look at this with me right now. On the front of the card, there are three boxes for you to fill out. All right, the first is, says, I'll support Faith Promise with my resources. This is a financial commitment. I want you to notice there's a blank for your money, and then it says week or month. All right, you can give weekly or monthly. There's a little table on the back to help you figure out what that, what that pledge would look like. But you would put your number on this card, and then in a few minutes, you'll drop that card in the offering plate. Now, we don't track this money. You don't put your name on this card. This isn't between you and Pinedale. This is between you and God. All right, now you could say, well, then why do I even need to write it down at all? The answer is because we use the numbers that come from these cards to budget for our missions for this year. So we really need to have an idea of what's happening. But the truth is, this is between you and the Lord, not between you and the church. So you don't need to put your name on this. But you would put a number down, circle whether it's weekly or monthly. There's also a block here where you can say, I'm going to pledge time. We'd love to have you be part of the missions committee. They meet every month. Or maybe this is the year that you want to say, I'm going to find a way to put my boots on the ground in one of these countries and see this thing for myself. And I can promise you, I know this from experience, it will change you. You will not be the same after that happens to you. We have a trip coming up to Peru We have a trip to Jamaica this summer. There's other things on the docket. Just keep your eyes on the bulletin. Maybe this is the year that you want to make it happen to be part of one of those trips. Whatever is your decision, the bottom line is that these cards in your hand are worth something tremendous. We are part of a huge mission. God has given us an opportunity to be part of a really big deal. Look, it is a big world. You don't know how big until you get on a plane and fly 16 hours in the air and then get on a bus and ride 10 hours after that. Or when you get on a boat and go 12 hours across the lake on a bag of fish. (laughs) It's a big world. And it is a big church. We are just one small part of something that is tremendously huge. And in that verse Danny read earlier, one day we're all going to be together, praising the Lord together. But for right now, already we have an opportunity to join hands with Christian brothers and sisters all across the world in a show of solidarity and say, we're in this thing together. 
God is calling us to be part of something big. And that something starts with what you're holding in your hand right now. So I'm asking you, what is in your hand right now? It's an opportunity. This is an opportunity for something great. And so what's going to happen is that we're going to pray, and then the band is going to play, but don't stand up and sing. They're just going to play. They're going to play for a few minutes. They'll instruct you when it's time to stand. But during this first few minutes, I'd just ask, like to ask you to pray about this. What is God leading you to do here? And then the bags are going to come around. When the offering bags come around, two things can go in the same bag. You can put this card in the bag. And then if you brought an offering to be part of what Danny was talking about here with these four unreached people groups, if you want to contribute to that offering, put that in the same bag. All right, so the bags will go around. You can put that money in the bag and this card. We'll take the money and divide it up between these ministries. We'll use this to budget for this year in missions. All right, everybody understand your instructions? So we're going to start with prayer. This is between you and Jesus, not you and me. I want you to know, though, this is a great opportunity. What's in your hand right now? Ask God what you need to let go of to do something great. Will you pray with me? Lord, one more time before we collect this offering, I just want to thank you for the chance that you've given us. Lord, this isn't a burden, it's a privilege. Lord, it is an honor to be able to be a part of what you're doing that's so much bigger than us. And so, Lord, um, knowing that you took loaves and fish and multiplied them and, made, and fed a multitude, I just pray, Lord, that you would bless the offering that's about to be received. Bless the pledges, bless the offering. And, Lord, multiply it and use it in a bigger way than we could ever imagine. And, Lord, all over the world, Lord, I just pray that you would make this a blessing for folks who are serving you and spreading the gospel. And Jesus, until the day that you return, finally, once and for all, and make us all whole as one church, Lord, right now, until that day happens, help us to be faithful to you. And Lord, help us to, to see our bigger part of the mission that you've given us. Jesus, we ask this in your name. Amen.
to let the last word today happen for my friend here, Chuck Flynn. He's, he's, a lot of you know him, and he's got a pretty incredible story. But Chuck, just real quickly, tell, tell what's I, going on right now. I, I won't take a long time, but uh, I'm a grateful believer in Jesus Christ. And over 19 years ago, I was shot through the heart by a patient at the VA hospital in Salisbury. Survived over two hours through an impossible situation with my heart stand still for over 40 minutes and God brought me back after 30 minutes in heaven with him. I've had another problem. I had a blockage in the arteries going to, to my brain and I'd been on a medication to try to control that so I won't have a stroke. And I'd been praying about that, but the medication affected my liver and was causing liver damage, and we knew we had to take me off the medicine. They just sent me back to have a repeat ultrasound of my neck, and Matthew's been in prayer, Danny's been in heavy prayer for me. They're clear. <laughs> and I just, I just wanted to say... Whatever you're doing today, whatever your decision was today, it's like that song says, God's not dead, he's still working. <laughs> well, you get my brother Chuck here around. And let's, let's close the service in prayer. Father, thank you for Chuck, and thank you for what you're doing in his life, Lord. I know that around the room right now, Lord, there's people who are praying about a myriad of things. And Lord, I just pray that you will fill their hearts with confidence and hope and a reminder, Jesus, that you're on the, front, on the throne. And that no matter what, Lord, our confidence is in you. Jesus, we thank you, and thank you for a great morning here in this place. Help us to take the light into wherever we go. We ask this in your name. Amen. Have a great day.